good to have you on the show, Chris. And Thank you. Give us, for the audience, just a kind of a little bit of an overview of what you do. Um, do chartering on the Detroit River, April and May, jig and walleye vertically. See Captain Lance every day, basically, <laughs> which is good. Because guess what? We can actually share information and help put more people on fish. But uh, after that, I go down to Lake Erie. And kind of in the meantime, I do actually uh, some sonar installation. And I do uh, sonar ed education in the boat. And, that, and that's what we wanted to talk with you today. Um, about just kind of fine-tuning electronics. I see it so many times. And it's something that, that you guys talked about when I was with you in Dunkirk. And that, that's being able to really run across the water and see fish at speed and, and i see it so many times on uh you know facebook boards too where you have guys who are like you know I look at my sonar screen and it's just it's all dirty and so i think just kind of figuring out those those fine tuning things is really important i know it's something that you're you're talking about this weekend here at the show uh can you just kind of give us an overview on that um sure the one thing that i can say to start with is there are no settings that can fix a bad installation. So it really starts with having clean power, having a great installation that you can make small adjustments to if necessary to improve it. So without having, you know, the proper tools in place, you're pretty much having to start over. You know, I had a guy the other day ask a question about something that he was having an issue with. And I basically gave him a four step process online of, you know, you have to do this, this and this. And he told me that, well, I'm changing all new stuff. I'm like, well, you still have to start first, the first step because you can't just skip a step and have it work to give you those, you know, great returns. You know, and obviously there's a lot of things you can do to fine tune after that, you know, different transducers, different displays and whatnot to get out what you want. So you said the install, uh, the install's not right. It's going to be hard to, to get it where you need to be. What are some of the kind of the, the most common mistakes you see in an install? Most common, number one, starts with not having enough power. And that, I mean, that can be, that starts at the battery. No, you don't have to run a lithium ion battery. It's a great choice in many situations. But after that, you know, it's cabling, it's connections. You know, it, it all, it all plays a part in. How about, uh, how about the transducer and, and getting that mounted correctly and, and choosing the right uh, transducer for what you're looking for? Uh, great question. Steve, Steve just yeah. asked Looking up great is it's transducer, right? And it doesn't matter if it's a hummingbird or a Lorance. No, no, yeah. Um, this is not brand specific to the, the thing. In general, most of the companies bundle a all-in-one transducer that is far more capable than people actually understand it to be. It's not a bad place to start. The big problem is if it's not on starboard, we can't make adjustments. You know, once because the thing is nobody wants to put more holes in their hull. Right. Or any holes. <laughs> Well, there's ways to make something adjustable without having to do that. And starboard's the first step to making it so that you can make the adjustments you need. Without putting holes in. Without putting extra holes in. Uh, let's get back. Here's a question for you. It's probably more yeah, for I saw it for Jimmy, yeah. From Jim Lemon. Uh, he says, uh, on your pontoon, you have to run separate transducers for port and starboard side scans. I do not. Um, I have it on the uh, port tune. Uh, on the back of the port tune, there's a, there's a block there to put it on. And uh, I can see the way it sits. I can actually see through my motor. So I have a uh, three-in-one transducer. Not my ideal choice, but for a pontoon when it's really hard to run cables as opposed to a regular boat, uh, I run the, the active imaging three-in-one. I get great. I get sonar readings on that boat to about 25. A uh, really good side scan to about 20 and down scan at 25. So um, no, you don't, need, you don't need to run side by side. You don't need to run each side. Just one will do it and you can see both sides. So when someone's going to get, let's say they, they get the starboard, they're going to go out and try to get that transducer dialed in. How do they do that? Actually, all of the companies usually include instructions. So these are, <laughs> with the, these, yeah, these are, these are guys you're talking to. We're not going to get I know, I know, I know. But no, literally, there's actually instructions on how to properly mount everybody's transducer included mm -hmm. in the manuals. Well, basically, you put a piece of starboard on that lets you mount it where it's supposed to be. That's your best place to start. It really is. So when you say that, though, I mean, is there kind of a general rule of thumb as far as like angle? Or are you telling me that every brand has a specific way? No, actually, most of the transducers are really close where they have a starting point. Mm -hmm. 
Because at the end of the day, and Lance said it best, I heard it from probably 15 years ago. Not all holes are created equal. And if you're actually serious about sonar, you may want to choose a hull that is better for sonar than one that isn't. I can tell you right now, once you go under 20 feet in length in a boat, you put yourself at a disadvantage. Adding rivets can put yourself at a disadvantage. There's some boats that just will not give us good sonar return. And anything over 20, glass, welded boats, even riveted over 20, you can generally get great results. Pontoon boats are one that isn't the best. Uh, you know, the, the, pro the problem is, look at, sound travels through water at 40, 100 feet per second, right? Mm -hmm. Sound travels through air at, what is it, 780 some miles an hour, right? So it's not, it's not the same speed. So what happens is when you get turbulence and the shorter your boat is, and the more rivets you have, and the more strikes you have on the bottom, the more turbulence you get, the, the smaller air you have to get your transducer where there is none, right? So what happens is when you get air mixed in with the water, that, that ping goes down and it doesn't know how fast it should be going, right? And that, that's why it's important to, uh, most guys make the mistake, the biggest mistake I think we both see when we're looking at boats, the transducers are too low. Right? They're called skimmer transducers for a reason. They have the bottom of that transducer should be skimming along the surface of the water. You should be able to wide open, full throttle, full trim. You should be able to look over the back of your boat and see three quarters of your transducer out of the water. You want that bottom just to be skimming through clean water. If it's too low and you're throwing any kind of rooster tail, that water hits the front of the transducer, starts to cavitate. You've got air and water and you lose your signal. All right, a uh, couple questions coming through here. Uh, Jim's got another one. <laughs> I want to get Jim Wagner. <laughs> yeah, we got to get Jim Wagner next. But uh, Jim says, uh, for the starboard, what do you recommend for fastening, fastening it to 5200? Yeah, no, 5200 is a great product. It takes a while to dry. You know, we've got a patience issue coming in here. <laughs> At the end of the day, I use 5200 generally and a couple screws. Sorry, I'm not afraid to put a couple screws in my transom, your transom, his transom, Definitely doesn't my transom. matter. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, you know, I use both. Yeah. Because, you know, having backup is great. All right, this is the one that, that Lance wants, and I'm sure, I'm sure you'd like to check in as well. And Jim Wagner, Jim says, uh, can you take for granted that the dealer wired and set up your boat properly? No, and everything no, checked after no. Practice? Here's what I'll tell you, I'll make this simple. I'm not gonna let Chris talk about this. I'm gonna make this simple. If you put your transducer on yourself one time and haven't moved it, it's wrong. If your dealer put it on the first time and you haven't taken it out and tested and moved it, it's wrong. You'll never, ever, ever get it right the first time, ever. And I would tell you the faster guys put transducers on, the less chance it has of being right. So when a dealer's trying to crank out 20 boats because of the sunshine in February, and they're putting four screws, it ain't anywhere close. I've been close to perfect a few times. You got but, mine pretty good the first time. Yeah. yeah. But you got to realize, I'm not doing one boat, two boat. I'm doing a bunch, and I'm doing it for a reason, and every boat's different, you know. I have a I have a starting point. I literally throw in how deep is this boat going to sit in the water, how is it going to change, you know, the whole math of the water coming up afterwards. And So you're doing that then because you've done it so many times, assuming you can kind of figure that out without putting in the water. It's But it's still an educated guess. You know, there's, there's no, like you said, I make, I have to make adjustments to the ones that I do almost, almost every single time. And a 16th of an inch, left, right, up or down, can be the difference between losing it at 10 or getting it at 50. I mean, it's literally that little bit of an adjustment because those things are so picky on, you know, being exactly level, not getting, getting water instead of air. Uh, you, how you, you load gotta, your you boat. Do it. How, yeah, how you load your boat. You know, if, if you, if we have the same boat and we load it differently, it will affect that transducer settings for being optimal so what are the things that what are the factors there that come into play as far as how we would load a boat on um, you know battery placement it may not be the same on every boat how much tackle you're carrying how many guys are in your boat how big are your guys what side of the boat is the kicker on you know i mean it's things that you wouldn't think about but they are they all change how that boat rides in the water so maybe i go out there and the three of us are in the boat and we get it all dialed in it's perfect and then I go out there a week from now, it's just me. That that can have, have a big effect on how that transition it, Actually, goes. I can prove that on my own boat. My boat with the three of us and one more guy our size actually probably gives the best perfect settings that I can find for getting returns. 
One more take guy. Take two of us out. One more guy. So they can't get on point. <laughs> Wait a minute. I can still get on point. <laughs> but no, I mean, my settings are great for two guys in my boat. My settings seem to go to absolutely perfect with four guys in the boat. And I think that's key. I, I think with any kind of rigging, electronics, rod holes, whatever, always rig to how you're going to fish most often. Right? And then it's not always perfect, but always rig to how... You know, I, I run four charter customers in, in me in the Detroit River. Well, my motor is down on the bottom hole. Well, I could get an extra eight miles an hour out of my boat if I lifted it up, but I can't get on plane with that many guys. So you have to rig your boat for how you fish most often, right? What kind of gear you have. Look at it. Here's another thing guys don't think about when we're out doing transistor testing. Fill your live well. You got 30 gallon live well, that's 210 pounds on one side of the boat. That definitely affects how that boat's going to run, right? You want to, when you're doing transistor testing, you want to have your boat as close to how you are going to have it fishing that you can get it. Very good. Uh, Jim says, uh, he chimes in and says, his lawn with the Rado and Pro Kicker came from the dealer running everything off one battery. He had to redo everything. Yeah. And something that you talked about was his power. <laughs> um, you know, how, how does that work as far as how much power is enough? Power? Never enough. It's, well, there's, you can't have too much yeah. so i guess never enough works everybody's boat desire for what they're doing with their electronics changes you know i i don't know you know jim's boat yeah anytime you can i would put in a house battery period for electronics for anything that doesn't relate to the motor that way the motor has a dedicated starting source for itself and if you do it right you can actually in a case of emergency combine that with your house power to get you off the water because nothing is more important than safety. So, you know, but everybody's different, you know. I know Aunt, uh, Lance's boat probably draws up to about 40 amp hours on the house, which is extremely high. So his power need is maybe different than yours. Say your boat runs at, you know, maximum 20 amp hour. You know, it's it's different for everybody in every situation. <laughs> you know, even 10 years ago, black and white, you know, so you used to be able to get by with putting it on the cranky belly, right? Yeah. You add color. You add touchscreen. Touchscreen doubles your. You amp add load. these glass screens now that are, that are anti glare. Those work. Those draw power to actually make the, the the picture see. That all draws more power. And I add two of those units on your boat, right? You know, I'm running four units. Um, four units. A sonic cub for music. Uh, structure autopilot. Scan, structure autopilot, scan. Yeah. Definitely want to get it. Yeah, that's what I would tell people to do. Um, find somebody. Get a hold of Chris. Find Chris. Um, if you can't find Chris, find a Chris and yeah, there's uh, more than one. Out yeah, there. I, I mean, he, he's dedicated the last couple of years to becoming excellent at this. And it's, he's the only guy that touches my boat. Absolutely. The only guy that, that, that touches my boat at all. Don't let your dealer rig. Your find a pro. They do it. It's not that they're bad. They just do it. They have to do too many. Mm -hmm. They have to turn those boats over so quick that they don't pay attention to the details that it takes. Find a pro. It's going to cost you a little bit of money. Find a pro and it'll always be right from the start. All right, we got a question here from Nick Cook. We'll get to Nick's question. Uh, he says, interference between multiple transducers and different manufacturers, is there a way to fix it? Well, there's technically two ways to fix it. One is obviously separate out your transducers so each one's working at a different frequency. And then if you have to, buy a different transducer to get what you need from the one and the one from the other because they're not all the same. So uh, structure scan between like Lawrence and Hummingbird will start crossing over in the future because of the frequencies Lawrence is gonna start using, but hasn't necessarily in the past, unless you weren't paying attention, you actually ran them both at like 800. So yeah, separating out your frequencies actually allows you to use multiple things at the same time. Personally, I can run, well, I keep, I have five on my boat, transducers on the stern. Some of it's for testing, some of it's for very specific use. But I always try to keep them set up so that I don't have to think about, oh, so you know, the sonar pings removing targets. I always have them dedicated for something, so I'm just simply switching in between. Grab Tom's question. Tom, Tom, both. That's a, that's a great question. Great question. I'll let you read it, Lance. It's always recommended to do a hard reset for software updates. Can your settings be recovered or they all have to be reset talk about saving your settings before you do a hard reset okay save your waypoints all the time every time a display is not a safe storage place use an sd card 
uh, Marine Standard right now, 32 gigabyte max. Have a couple of them, they're cheap. Save your waypoints. You can do the same with settings. Um, there have been for, let's say, just pick Lawrence, there have been a couple updates where re-importing the settings can cause an issue. What I do personally, after every update, I always reset. I do not save my settings. I take the time to rebuild settings. So if I hop on your boat, you have current technology, and that's what I have, I can simply take my settings card, stick it in your unit, and your units will automatically have everything set up to mine and making a couple small changes rather than trying to figure it out. So, but you you, you can save them. You can save them. Hard reset. Try them. If the, if obviously, if it does, if it works fine, you're good. Yeah, if it works fine, you you're know. great. You know, guys that are running single displays, probably not ever really a big issue. It's when you get into multiple displays and extra modules is where that really starts to become an issue between some updates. And yes, I always hard reset after <laughs> every single update. All right, you brought up uh, double monitors, and there's there's people who haven't got into that yet. Why why do that? <laughs> More information to view at the same time. You know, nobody's eyes, and I can say everybody here and everybody there. Nobody's eyes are getting better with age. Hey. So having having a more you know screen space to display is it's great. Yeah, yeah. So so you're looking at minimum, right? You're looking at regular sonar, down scan, side scan, and GPS. Put all four of those on a 16 inch screen, and they're not very big, right? So you get even two nine inch screens, and you put two of those on. Those are those are bigger pieces of information than all four on a 16 inch screen. Um, plus the, you know, I, I run two on the bow and two on my console. Now I have a redundant factor. If one unit goes down, I still have a unit at the console. If one unit goes down the bow, I still have a unit on the bow, right? Um, I, I would rather have somebody buy two nine inch units than buy a 12 or a 16. Or if you're going to buy a 16, you got that kind of money, buy two 12s or 12 and a nine. You're better off with two units just simply because it just gives you bigger pictures and more adjustability, right? You, you, it's just a whole lot easier whole lot easier. I have on my pontoon, I got one 12 inch unit because there's not a place to put anything else. How about my polar craft? And I got two 12s on the bow and two 12s on the console. I'm like, this is nice, right? Um, but I would rather have you buy two smaller units. I think that's a piece, better piece of advice, two smaller units than one bigger unit. And one thing, quick thing Lance didn't mention, two, pro, two smaller units properly networked, you now doubled your mapping sources availability for card slots. You know, I, I think Matt Lance does. I know I do. I run four different mapping sources at a time. Am I viewing them all the time? No. But having multiple units gives me the option to have more available without taking the time to pop the card out, pop the card in, you know, and then start looking. And if you want to record your sonar, right, to either go back and look at it or upload it to make custom mapping, now there's an extra card slot for that. You know, two units, you got four card slots. One unit, you got two. You've doubled the amount of card slots. Um, that's usually you know, one of the questions that Chris and I get. Chris is doing a seminar here on custom mapping, GPS mapping. One of the questions we get all the time is, you know, what map chip do I use? And the answer is yes, right? Um, it, it really it, is. It, you know, there, there's basically four different major map chips. You need to have all four because there's information on each one that isn't on the other three. Um, you know, some are better at buoys and navigation and that type of information. Some are better at structure than others. Some are better for fishing than others. Some let you see major pieces of structure better than others that have actually more detail but you can't see big pieces of structure so um more card slots you got uh, the more the more fun you can have awesome. chris appreciate you coming on yeah let's do a right hand shake this time thank you <laughs> i just want to have he's, you knock over he's any the best uh, you can get a hold of him through us at teach and fishing Perfect. uh go to teachfishing.com just send us a, a contact we can get a hold of chris um he is he he absolutely is 100 percent the best awesome thank well you, thanks sir. Oh, I didn't know it was the best. You're 100% the best. He hasn't tried right. it. I haven't got the bill yet for bringing my boat, so. <laughs> You're great, Chris. Thanks. <laughs>